Hello and welcome to Under the Dome from Town Meeting TV. My name is Bobby Lucier. Under the Dome is your community's uh, source of information for the Vermont Legislature. And with the legislative session having wrapped up a couple of months ago, we are now talking with uh, the leaders of the Vermont Legislature here in September to talk a little bit about what was accomplished this past session and what's coming up in 2024. So last week we spoke with President Pro Tem of the Senate, Phil Baruth, and this week we're joined by Speaker Jill Krawinski. Thank you so much, Speaker, for joining us. Yes, thanks for having me. Awesome. So uh, this was your second session as Speaker of the House, is that right? My second biennium. Second biennium. Okay, right. And But this was your first biennium fully in person. Yes, we started in the chamber the first day, everyone together. Right. Okay. Yes. So how does that change the job? How, is, how does it feel to be you know, to, to be legislating in person as opposed to over Zoom the past couple of years? Well, I will say that COVID really made us appreciate more the ability to govern in person together. Uh, I will say that uh, governing on Zoom, we had to do it. It was important for public health and safety for us to do that. Um, but you really lose the opportunity to build relationships. Um, you're not running into people in the hallway and talking about a bill or an issue that's come up, you know, you're clicking, you're clicking like leave meeting and you're just in your office in your room by yourself. And so uh, I was really proud of the way though that everyone came together to get through it. And so it was even more special to be together um, that first day to swear everyone in, in person. And um, for those of us who were returning, uh, it, was, it was a big deal. And I think, like I said, it just really made us appreciate the ability to be governing in person. And there are things that we took away from um, <laughs> legislating on, on Zoom that we kept because it increased access to, pe to the people um, to, to come and participate in the building. So before COVID, you know, if you wanted to hear a committee hearing, you had to go and request um, it from legislative council and you would be mailed a thumb drive. <laughs> now, uh, now you can just go on our legislative website and click a link to YouTube and watch the hearing either in real time um, or go back to it and people can now participate by uh, testifying on Zoom. And I, I, I just think uh, it's really opened up the doors to the state house in a way that we hadn't before. And so um, that's been really important. So yeah, so great, it's great to be back. <laughs> it's a huge leap in access to yes. people to actually join the committee hearings. And does it change the way that you actually legislate? Were you, did you feel like the process was a little bit different when you're able to actually talk face to face with colleagues between hearings and things like that? Well, we spent, you know, when, when, when the pandemic came, we didn't have a, a manual on how to govern remotely. And so while we were, you know, working on Zoom and passing laws and holding hearings, we were making up the process as we went to make sure that we were doing everything we could to keep people safe and to be um, effective and efficient. And so we spent just a lot of time talking about what that looks like. and. Um, testing out different methods, especially with how we returned. And so it just took a lot of time um, to make sure that we had a process that was working. And so now that we have that set that um, is helpful and we can return and be working in person without having to worry about what the next step is or how we do it. Uh, it has sparked some conversations about how we set up the building for success if some other sort of event happened. Uh, and so we're actually in active conversations about what do we want the state house to look like? Should we expand? Should we um, look at um, bettering our HVAC systems? And so uh, that's something that's underway right now. And I think uh, we all are looking forward to, have, to having this conversation because for us, it's just so important that we're doing everything we can to make the building a warm and welcoming place. And um, we got a plan for the future. So. That's underway right now. Great. Um, so we'll talk a little, I know there, it was a busy session, a lot accomplished this year, but first we'll just take a sort of step back, big picture, what does your office do? I know you're the one at the podium, kind of leading the house in, in some ways, but what, do you, what does your office do behind the scenes and what is your sort of job description like? Sure. Well, first off, I have to say it is such a pleasure um, and uh, honor to serve as Speaker of the House. I had never planned on doing that. Um, and uh, after serving as Majority Leader, um, the, current, the Speaker at the time lost her reelection bid and we kind of had to make a decision about who was gonna run. And I think my experience through COVID 
um, and my experience in the building uh, led me to, to go for this role and to run for it. And I've been really proud to have the full support of the body, um, Republicans, uh, independents, progressives, Democrats, um, all supported my election and that was meaningful. Uh, this, the office of the speaker is just, no two days are ever alike. It's a, it's a fantastic job where we manage the flow of bills between the House and the Senate. Uh, I preside over the House chamber. Uh, I'm the spokesperson for the House of Representatives. I am the lead negotiator with, um, and communicator with the administration. And um, there are things that just happen day to day in the building that come up that need to be addressed. I work closely with our legislative council on bills, um, our joint fiscal office on understanding the money behind the bills, uh, and work with our sergeant at arms to make sure that the building is safe and things are running um, e efficiently. But it's great. I have to say that uh, there are these moments that we have that are just so special. For example, we had um, the Girl Scouts come and visit and it was great to spend time with them and take them to the podium. And I made sure every single girl stood at that podium and was like, you could be here someday. And those moments, um, whether it's talking to young girls about what they could do and what's possible or gaveling out after passing a historic housing bill or childcare bill is um, pretty incredible. And uh, I also see it as my job is to work really hard to bring people together and to get things done. So you must work pretty closely with um, the folks on the Senate side. So the mm -hmm. House is one half of things and the Senate um, is, is the other. So we spoke with President Pro Tem Phil Bruth last week and talked with him about some of his reflections on the session. What does your collaboration with Senator Bruth's office look like and how do you, yeah, what, what does that look like to be working alongside the Senate, recognizing that it's a different chamber with different different voting priorities sometimes? Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, it's it's been great to work with Senator Baruth. Um, before that, I worked with Senator Ballant, and so I had some experience of how to work with the other chamber and to work collaboratively to get things done. Uh, and so that means uh, many, many different things. It's uh, communicating about legislation and uh, figuring out the path for for our high top priority bills. It's how we collaborate with bringing our members together. Uh, one thing that we've talked about doing more is holding more joint hearings, um, which I think is really important and shows that we're working together and hearing the same information at the same time. Uh, we work together with communicating and uh, negotiating with the administration and that's really important. And I think that it's, uh, it's up to us to set a good tone and show um, how we can work together. Uh, the, the governing process is set up for some tension uh, between the House and the Senate. That's not unique to our state. Every state um, talks about that. Uh, I was actually just at a conference uh, with all the um, House speakers, uh, and it was a topic that came up, is how to work uh, well, not only across the aisle, but across chambers. Uh, and I think we've done a good job in, in living up to that expectation to do that. And I think communication is just key, just like with any job, uh, to make sure that we're on the same page and under listening um, as to what the concerns are and how we work work together. Right, right. Yeah. So there's collaboration with the other chamber, and then there's also collaboration with the administration. Right. And that, I mean, this was a pretty historic session in terms of the amount of vetoes that Governor Scott signed. What does your collaboration with the governor's office look like? Are you... How often are you kind of meeting with him in his office and you know speaking with them about the work that you're doing throughout the session and and off session? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, we meet on a regular basis when we're in session, and again, I think communication is key. Um, I try if I'm going to be sending out um, a press release. Um, uh, asking him to take action on something. I try to give him a heads up that I'm going to do that. I think it's really important that we're taking time to listen to one another and to hear each other's concerns. Um, one example I'll say, uh, I'll talk about is around the um, emergency housing transition with the hotels. And we were really struggling with how the administration was showing up. And uh, we asked for a meeting with him to talk about it. And out of that meeting, we came up with the framework for a bill for us to work on together. And so, you know, I think uh, what I've seen in other states, it's pretty rough. I think here uh, we do try really hard to work together. 
And the flooding, you know, has been a very tragic event that's impacted so many people. It's impacted our capital. Uh, I've spent time in Barrie um, talking to people there about their struggles. And it's really critical that we work together um, to make sure that we're doing everything we can in this recovery. And we'll absolutely be working on that when we return in January. Right. I mentioned there were quite a few bills passed, including some that, that overrode the governor's veto. Uh, do you want to talk about just a couple of the bills that you're really proud of that, that made it out of this session that will have an impact on Vermont communities? Absolutely. Well, you know, before the pandemic happened, we knew housing was an issue, especially affordable housing in the state. And then when COVID came, it just made the problem even worse. And now we had the flooding. <laughs> so um, housing has been and continues to be a top priority for us. Uh, last legislative session, we passed an epic housing bill that really invested in affordable housing, uh, incentivized building um, in downtowns with different types of you know duplexes, triplexes. We want to discourage sprawl and encourage building in downtown towns. Uh, and we invested money for first-time home buyers and really laser focus on how we can do better with affordable housing. Um, it, you know, right now it's so costly to build, right? The, the cost of supplies, uh, the supply chain has been very <laughs> challenging for us. Um, so we're slowly seeing these units come online. And I was just in Morrisville a couple weeks ago, and there were multiple buildings um, and homes uh, in different corners of the town uh, coming online and opening up units. And so it's exciting to see it um, out across Vermont happening, um, but we have to do more. So we'll be tackling that when we return in January. Um, our child care bill um, was also um, the product of years of work to get to the point where we can invest in our child care providers, create more slots, and help families afford it. You know, when I talk to small businesses across the state, they're like, the two things we have challenges with is housing and child care. You know, we can't um, hire people because they can't find places to live, or when, the, when an employee has a child, they can't find access to child care, so they leave and stay home. People shouldn't have to choose between their job and taking care of a child. We can do better. And so I'm really proud of our child care bill. And then we did some really interesting work around workforce development. Um, so for the last several years, we've been investing money into grants and forgivable loans around uh, critical careers, uh, like creating uh, more jobs for electricians, carpenters, nurses. Um, we have a nursing shortage in our state that is uh, very, very much a big problem. And so by investing in these careers, people are getting job training and we're creating workers for, for the, the businesses out there that need it. So I think that those connections have been really helpful in supporting our working families and helping our state thrive. Uh, I'm uh, going to be heading up to Newport soon for a project that was born out of uh, legislative um, priority of ours. We, are, we put money into training programs for uh, tech ed and there are students that are learning how to build and rehab houses. They got money through one of our state programs to buy uh, a vacant home to um, rebuild it. And so we are seeing a home that's going to come back online. Um, and I think they're going to actually make it a duplex even maybe. So possibly two homes online while they're getting trained and they're going to be ready um, to get hired. Uh, after with the people who are helping to run the training. And so it's just great when you see um, <laughs> an idea that was formed in a committee room and then see it out in a community actually happening and, and people um, just really in, thriving on the programs. And so that's been great. Yeah. You mentioned the legislature's laser focus on housing. I want to ask quickly about the motel housing program and how that yeah. progressed. So, so this was, a, an, this was a program that was funded by federal COVID funding right yep. during the pandemic to house as many as 3,000, over 3,000 people in hotels and motels throughout the state. And then that federal funding dried up because it was COVID related and the program was set to expire this summer. Um, at the beginning of the session, it wasn't, it didn't seem like something that was, you know, prioritized at the top of the list in terms of legislators or the governor saying that they wanted to extend this program. But then towards the end of the session, there was this big push to um, to make sure that these people were not you know mass evicted from from the motels, 
And when all was said and done, a form of the program was extended. About 2,100 people were allowed to stay in motels until next April is um, <clears throat> what currently is passed. And, and the state has now taken on the, the expenses for that program. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> uh, some of it. OK, great. Yeah, I know. Please, definitely. Uh, I mean, I just I think the question is just yeah. well, just what sort happened? of walk us through yeah. what happened. Like how, you know, there, sure. it wasn't really on the radar in the beginning of the session, it seemed, and then it kind of um, gained traction and there was sure. this pivot to, to sure. put together a bill at the very yeah. end. So we had many programs funded by the federal government dur during the pandemic to keep people healthy and safe. Mm -hmm. uh, this motel, uh, I don't call it a program because literally they just sent a check to cover the housing for, for the motel. So there wasn't any services really provided. It depended where you lived, on um, what kind of supports you got. And um, it has been on our radar and has been a priority to figure out how can we transition these families so that they can be successful. Um, I think it's a disservice just to keep people in hotels without any sort of wraparound services. Um, and then, you know, <laughs> not to have anything after uh, is a huge problem. And so we worked throughout the session to find ways to transition families so that they can go into housing that has supports around it. Uh, and that's where the tension was and continues to be is because there's not housing available. <laughs> and so communities are coming up with different solutions and how to support people um, exiting uh, from the hotels. But also we do have a larger homelessness issue in our state. And so I think another thing that was important to us is that we weren't just focused on this population, but also the wider conversation of how we can support um, unhoused um, Vermonters and, and to help them find a path to success. So during the session, um, even last year, we were having this conversation of what we can do. and. Um, and uh, there were lots of different ideas and um, debates around how we do that. And I think people, and all, everyone in general, wants to support this population and find a way forward. And I think there are lots of ideas, on, and that was the tension of how we do that. Um, I think we landed with a good compromise with the administration, but um, I continue to be concerned about how this transition is happening. Um, I, you know, we've been asking the administration for updates on um, on the different programs that we've been funding. We haven't been getting a lot of information. So our joint fiscal committee has been doing a lot of oversight, um, and I encourage people who are interested in this topic to watch and to get information there. But we have a we have a path, and I just have to say our community providers who have been out there working in the field. Um, have been incredible, and I, they were burnt out already from COVID. And then we have, um, you know, this issue around supporting um, our unhoused, and then the flooding. And so uh, we just have incredible staff across the state who are working so hard uh, to help. And so, if you ever have an opportunity to see them and thank them, please do because it's so important. Absolutely. Yeah. And so you mentioned we we have this path. We also have it seems like another sort of deadline for the program in mm -hmm. April. Mm -hmm. What's the what's can you say a little bit more about the path forward after April? Do you see the do you foresee the program being extended again, or how? Where do you see these folks finding sure. housing after the program ends? Or, Right, so that's what we're doing now, is we have a process laid out so that um, community providers have access to different programs available to help this population. In the meantime, while we're seeing what's working and what's not working out in the field, uh, we are prepping for January to really look at how can we um, do more prevention <laughs> and making sure that people are able to stay in their homes so that we can pr prevent people from being unhoused. So there's a model called Housing First. Um, housing First is making sure that people have a home and receive services. We have it happening in some corners of our state, but it's not statewide. Um, this has been a program used in different states and people have found success with it. And so our question is how can we make it, what's the Vermont version of that look like and how can we roll that out? So we're looking at ways to create more affordable housing and looking at extending this program in some way. Um, our general assistance program that helps families in need 
uh, really needs to be modernized. And I think that we can do a lot um, in modernizing that program to help families uh, be on a better foot for success. Uh, so those are some of the examples of what we're working on to prepare for January um, when we look at how we can do better around supporting our unhoused Vermonters. We'll, and we'll continue to monitor you know, the situation with the transition and see, again, um, you know, it's a lot of people at one time when we don't have a lot of housing already. And so making sure that um, we're using all of our tools in the toolbox to, to help them find success. Right. And Senator Bruce last week sort of mentioned that there might, you know, if there's not a clear solution in place for, for many of these folks come April, the program could be extended. Do you see that also being on the table? Everything's on the table. Um, I just think that, and there's things that we don't know about that could happen. It, like we could have another, I really hope this doesn't happen, but we could have another outbreak um, that causes us to have to go back to um, being extra safe and being uh, governing online or um, making sure that everyone's housed, right? Like there's mm -hmm. just, uh, it, Everything is in flux right now, uh, but uh, I, when it comes to this program and other programs to help people, um, we can, we'll continue to monitor it. And if it needs to be extended or there's another way that we come up with, like we have to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And just on the funding side of things, this is seems to be a pretty expensive approach. It's a, paying motel owners $140 a night for each room. Is that? What's, what's That's happening? That's about right. So in the legislation that we passed, so the administration did have the ability to negotiate rates with um, hotels. We mm -hmm. didn't see that happening to the, to the extent that we wanted. So we did put that in our bill at the end to give them the authority to do that. Um, I have not heard if they were successful in negotiating lower rates. I know that they were working on it, um, but it is expensive, and that's why um, there was tension to say, like, is this the best way to house people? Yeah. Um, and if it's not, what are the alternatives that are good for them, that mm -hmm. provide services and aren't as costly? Yeah. Is there is there any, you know, where might... Um, other folks in the Vermont community see the impact of extending this program and their taxes and their finances you know, as, as you pass a bill to foot the bill for this this program that was covered by federal funds right well we are um, looking at different ways to fund these programs next session I think that modernizing our general assistance program and looking at different ways to house people will make it more affordable for Vermonters across the state um, for now we've said that this is a priority and that uh, it's important that we're doing everything we can to house the to house um, people who need it and try to get them the support so I really see us in a transition right now um, but I, you know, housing has just always in recent times been a struggle for us. And so again, that's why it remains a priority and we'll be doing more work this session that I think will make it better. Right. I want to shift to a sort of related subject, which is the overdose crisis. So mm -hmm. at least in Burlington and, and throughout the state, there's been a lot of discourse about both public safety and, um, the increase in overdoses and overdose deaths in the state. You live in Burlington. I also live in Burlington. I live on Elmwood. And I've seen a huge increase just this summer in um, drug use on the streets and property theft. And um, I've also seen, you know, we've seen the data. There's an unprecedented level of overdose deaths on the streets this year. And so, uh, and we asked our, our followers on social media, you know, we're talking with the legislative leaders. What do you want um, us to, to ask them and the majority of questions yeah. were about um, or about this issue and, and how you all are thinking about the overdose crisis. So um, how are you thinking about both public safety? Are you feeling safe in Burlington? And also how are you thinking about the overdose crisis and how to support people who are, or who are using drugs? Sure. Yeah, so this session we passed a bill that was laser focused on um, substance uh, misuse prevention and uh, we, in that effort, created a statewide syringe program, um, it increased access to treatment for those who are on Medicaid, uh, and put more money into prevention and for the workforce that are supporting um, people who are in recovery. 
Um, and we did uh, some work on recovery housing as well because there's a big need for that as well. Um, surprise housing again coming up. Uh, but it, it is something that we know is a problem and we'll continue to work on. I hope that we start to see some of the, the uh, work of that bill being implemented to help what's happening out um, in our communities. Uh, you know, I, I live in the Old North End. I've, I've seen the uptick as well. Um, I feel like in our neighborhood, we've worked really hard like as a neighborhood watch to be supportive um, of what we're seeing on the street and helping people if they're in need. Uh, but we are seeing this uptick and it's very, con very concerning. And so I, I'll continue to work with um, our city administration. I just was talking to the mayor the other day um, to make sure that the city is getting the access that it needs to the resources that we provided in this bill. And um, I think we're gonna just uh, need to continue to collaborate and figure out what are the, the biggest needs um, and what's working and what's not working. Um, it's not going to just go away. You know, there's not one policy that's going to fix this, right? Because it's a combination of treatment, housing, and um, other services. And we have, you know, a, a challenge with having enough staff to provide services. And so, again, that's why um, we're focused on workforce as well uh, to help with this problem. But it, it, it's concerning. It's very concerning. Yeah. Is there anything that you foresee coming up in 2024 in the legislature that you know you hope would impact this issue? Absolutely, yeah. So um, more uh, funding and support for workforce to have um, more access to uh, people who can provide treatment, uh, knocking down any other barriers that we hear about with access to treatment. Um, you know, for example, we hear stories as we're traveling the state about. Um, you know, a one provider, for example, was talking about access to telemedicine and it's like, yes, like what can we do to make sure that everyone has full access to telemedicine when receiving treatment? Uh, so we learn about some things that are, could make the situation better. Um, and that's why it's so important for us to be out talking to providers around the state. And so again, uh, workforce is really important, um, more funding for programs to, to help people and recovery housing. I want to shift to something that didn't pass this year, and that's um, a bill to address family paid family leave mm. in Vermont. And so we saw the House prioritize mm -hmm. paid family leave this year, and it seems like you had enough votes not just to pass a bill, a, a significant investment in paid family leave, but also to o override a potential veto. And then in the in the Senate side, there actually weren't enough notes, votes at one point at least to, to even pass the bill by a simple majority. And so how are you characterizing right now the differences and the priorities between the House and the Senate on that issue? And I think it's just, you know, how do you, how is it possible for two, the two chambers representing the same constituents of Vermonters to be so far apart on mm -hmm. an issue like this and what's the path forward? Sure. Well, first I'll say I don't think we're that far apart. <laughs> <laughs> I can't speak for my senators, mm -hmm. but I, I can tell you about our experience. And to start with, I just think it's important to discuss why paid family leave, right? So in Vermont, we are an aging state. And so we have a lot of families that are taking care of their their parents, their the, their the older people in their lives, and their children. Um, this is not, it's not sustainable with work. And I hear stories from every corner of the state of people struggling to take time off of work and to take care of of a sick parent. And that's a horrible place to be. Um, and I talk to businesses that say, like, I'm losing employees. We can't hire people. And so just like childcare and housing, we view paid family medical leave as a way um, to help keep people in the workforce and to take care of themselves and their family. Um, we've been working on this bill for years. Uh, in fact, one of the first study committees I ever was assigned to like 10 years ago was on a paid family medical leave uh, study to see how can we make this a reality in Vermont. Uh, we, two bienniums ago, we passed paid family leave out of the House and the Senate. Um, the governor vetoed it. So now we're coming back to take another um, go at getting this across the finish line. Uh, I think that in general, people support the concept. It's how you pay for it. And I think and that's just so many issues that we talk about is how is it funded? And so um, 
that's where we're continuing to do work over the summer and fall is to look at different options. And as I meet with other speakers across the country, I'm asking them how they did it. And there's several different ways and approaches. And so I think our next step is to say, okay, what are the different options available? Um, and what fits for us? What makes sense for us in Vermont? Um, and so we're, we're still working hard on it. Yeah, so what was the funding mechanism in the bill that was introduced this year in the House? It was a payroll tax that was split between the employer and the employee. Uh, and we ended using that mechanism to fund the child care bill. So mm -hmm. um, again, we gotta find another another way, another approach on how we can support it. But you know, one thing that I'm really proud of with this bill is that it doesn't define families um, in the normal way. It, it, we're all in Vermont. Some of us, you know, like my neighbor <laughs> uh, is is like my my mom. You know, like we we're uh, the way that we define who we support and love is just different. And so, I think what was really important to us is to say like this is about taking care of the people in your life um, that you rely on and you care about so that if they get sick, um, you don't have to explain a relationship, <laughs> uh, you're able to take care of them. And, and that's really, I think that's just really important that it reflects who we are and how we look as families mm -hmm. now, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, I, I, really, I really appreciate that. You know, in Vermont, a family can look a lot of different ways. Yeah. Um, I, I was reading an article in Vermont Digger about the difference between seeing the child care, the push for child care bill, which was successful this year, and the push for family and medical leave. And the child care push was really well funded and mm -hmm. had, had um, you know, Let's Grow Kids is this really large organization that was pushing for that work. And the paid family medical leave side of things, there isn't sort of an equivalent, really sort of a powerhouse advocacy mm -hmm. organization that's pushing for this. Do you see that playing a role? I mean, I remember a quote, I forget who it was, it was from an advocate for the paid family and medical leave bill saying, you know, especially on the Senate side of things, it's hard to get an issue in front of senators unless there's a lot of funding behind an advocacy push. Do you agree with that? Does that kind of, or, or you know, what, what do you think is, how do you think about resourcing and advocacy when it comes mm. to these issues? Is it, and is there a big difference there? Yeah, I think that, you know, when you, uh, first of all, Let's Grow Kids is an amazing organization that's done really great work in educating the public about the need for child care um, and for the bill that we, we passed. That's really important. Um, I think it's really critical for us as legislators um, not uh, to, to treat issues fairly and not to, um, you know, if there's not a coalition, that doesn't mean that there's not a need for it. Uh, I, I have seen um, the growth of a coalition behind the paid family leave bill this summer. Um, AARP has taken a greater role and interest in this, which is fantastic. So I think that there is work being done as part of a coalition, but it's important that um, we, we treat all these issues equally and, and give um, these topics the, the time um, that, they, that they need. And like I said, you know, we've passed this before. Uh, this isn't the first time. And so I think that um, the coalition that was there to support it the first time around um, has changed and people have left and, you know, it, it's an evolving group. But at the end of the day, um, we need to take what our constituents um, ask us for and ask for help for and act on that. And that's what's important. Right. I want to shift now to talking about the flooding from this mm -hmm. summer. So it looks like at least 4,000, over 4,000 homes have been damaged by the flooding and many small businesses are struggling to reopen and mm -hmm. some are, are having to close their doors. So you just talk a little bit about how the state is responding to the, the flooding damage and what does recovery look like and are there resources actually there to meet the need that we're seeing right now? Yes, yes, absolutely. So I have to say that FEMA has been incredible in helping our communities across the state who've been impacted by the floods. Uh, they uh, were on the ground quickly with the Red Cross um, providing services and now we're starting to see that shift from uh, crisis to recovery and so FEMA is now starting to close um, their doors um, with the headquarters that they set up across the state. 
and we're waiting to hear back to understand what is being covered and not covered by the federal government um, for the floods. Uh, there are multiple programs out there to help homeowners and small businesses um, and, and employees who are impacted um, kind of bridge them um, and get them to a better place. But that's not going to be enough. We know that's not going to be enough. So um, another thing that uh, the federal government uh, recently announced was that we could use ARPA funds in uh, recovery efforts. Um, for, so if it's, um, whether it's fires or flooding, um, that we could use those funds. That's new and that's super helpful for us. So right now we're gathering information about what the, what the needs are and we'll have a better understanding when we come back in January where the gaps are with the federal funding and with ARPA um, and what state dollars will be needed. And we have to expect that flooding events like this will continue to happen as the climate continues to warm. So how is the legislature thinking about climate resilience in the state yes. and making this recovery process um, easier and avoiding, you know, uh, folks living in floodplains who are devastated over and over by the, these flooding events? Um, you know, how is the legislature thinking about climate resilience right now? Absolutely. So we are working on legislation on this very topic. I'm very excited about it. Um, it'll be uh, lots of different aspects from the question of where to build <laughs> and how to build um, to be resilient from floods. You know, it's been fascinating to watch um, the community in Montpelier talk about whether they want to keep their downtown uh, where it is or to move it because it is in the floodplain. And I think it's just natural that towns and cities, you know, grew around water, right? <laughs> uh, and and it's part of the their identity. And so they just made, recently made the decision to stay, that they want to keep um, their businesses downtown. So that means what measures do we need to take to help them be safe from flooding in the future? What does that look like with, um, with dams? What does that look like? with how we just manage water um, and, and rivers. And so um, uh, the chair of the Environment and Energy Committee, uh, Representative Amy Sheldon, uh, is working with a group of members um, on what that bill, um, that bill looks like. And so I think there's a lot of momentum for that this session, and um, I look forward to getting that across the finish line. Yeah. yeah. Now I want to shift to a couple of issues that are um, that we're thinking about a lot here mm. at CCTV and Town Meeting TV. The first one has to do with language access. Mm -hmm. So the Office of Racial Equity released a report earlier this year recommending some investments in expanding language access and translating materials across state government. Um, the Language Justice Project housed here at CCTV has been producing informational videos mm -hmm. in 17 different languages spoken in Vermont um, refugee and immigrant communities ac across the state, uh, videos about um, how to take a COVID test or how to access food access programs and how to enroll in health insurance, things like that. Most recently, we also, um, the project released a, a bunch of videos about um, how to stay safe during the floods and, and yeah. how to recover from them safely. Um, but there's still, we're just seeing a huge need for this life-saving information to actually reach uh, these populations that have language access needs. So how are you thinking about, how's the legislature thinking about language access right now? And uh, particularly, particularly for folks who um, are who struggle to read and write even in their own languages and are um, are are responding. I mean, we've seen a lot of um, engagement with you know s very simple videos that are able to communicate ideas as opposed mm -hmm. to sort of complex translated written materials right. that are kind of hidden on a website. So how are you right. thinking about that? Well, uh, this is something that we have been looking at at the in the legislature, and in fact. Um, our Government Operations and Military Affairs Committee heard um, a presentation about, about this and um, was, had a request for more funding, and they were like, absolutely, yes. So in last year's budget adjustment, uh, we had a million dollars invested in this work, and we'll continue to do that. Uh, it's something that we think about, too, as well as a legislature. And uh, last year, we actually uh, cr created the the opportunity for people who don't speak our language to pick which language they want to see the legislative web page in. And I think there's over 100 languages that are available. And so uh, it, is, it's, it is important that everyone in our communities have access um, so that they can 
you know, fully participate and know what's happening. And so, uh, like I said, we've invested money uh, in this effort and we'll continue to in the future. That's great. And then um, last question here, I want to shift to Town Meeting TV's work as a government access center. So we're one of 24 access centers across the state and community media and public access centers are funded by a fee on every cable subscriber's monthly bill. And that money is then entrusted to municipal representatives to develop contracts with Town Meeting TV and other access centers to cover municipal meetings and also um, cover events out in the community and, and, and make media resources available to people. Um, and as we all know, media consumption is certainly not declining, but cable subscriptions are in decline. Mm -hmm. And so access centers are receiving less and less funding each year um, to cover and, and um, to cover the, the democracy that we're all trying to participate in. And so this is just one example. There's a, kind of a larger question here about funding mechanisms becoming outdated or you know another example would be the um, electric vehicles causing the revenue from the gas tax to decrease so how do you think about funding mechanisms that are kind of evolving and, and as they kind of um, become out of date or, or you know trying to update them sure yeah well first of all i have to say every t every town meeting day i'm watching cctv so i appreciate <laughs> all all your work and in creating more access for the public uh to, to our local government that's great uh this has been an ongoing conversation that we've been having uh, i i've sat down many times with lauren glenn to talk about how we can um do a better job to support um local media and I know we're we're actually going to be meeting sometime soon to talk about it so uh, I, I think it is important for us to be looking at how we modernize how we fund things and that's not a new conversation like you mentioned electronic vehicles and mm -hmm. so there's um, many examples of places where we're taking time to really look at how can we update this to match what's happening uh, in our communities right now and so I think uh, how, how we fund uh, public access television um, and other things is, is something that we have to do and will continue to do. Uh, I don't, you know, we don't have an answer right now. I think that we need to have a lot more testimony on it and hear from Vermonters about how they want um, to, to support this work. And so uh, we'll, be, we'll be talking about that in January. Awesome. And yeah. We have a couple minutes left. Is there anything that we didn't touch on that you want to make sure that you mention here? Sure. Uh, a couple of things that uh, didn't make the, the headlines in a big way um, that I think are important to Vermonters. Um, so we have, we talked a little bit about mental health. Um, but we have a crisis on our hands with suicide in our state. Um, we have one of the highest rates of suicide in the country. And over the last couple of years, our numbers have been steadily going up. And that's unacceptable. Uh, <laughs> we're failing uh, our, our people. And so we had a bill this last session that looked at how can we um, have longer term uh, protections and support for people who are in crisis in short term. The short-term bill is what we call their suicide prevention bill that had a waiting period to buy guns. Um, it expanded our extreme risk protection order law so that people had greater access to say, this person is, is not safe to have a gun, um, and, and uh, did some provisions around state, uh, safe storage. Um, we've passed waiting periods several times and the governor have vetoed them. Uh, but this year, we were all in um, I'm making sure that we got this across the finish line because it, we can't wait any longer. Uh, a 72 hour waiting period uh, shows that we can save lives. And I you know it was controversial, but I have to say we had the support at the end. Um, over 100 members supported this bill. And it went into effect um, beginning of July. And in August, we got a text message. Uh, someone, on, a member, uh, got a text message that said, I just want you to know that it worked and that a young man in crisis tried to buy a gun and couldn't. And he is alive today because of this bill. And so um, that's so meaningful. Uh, it's, it, we don't often hear when something's working. We hear about when it's not working. And so to know that this bill is already saving lives is huge. Yeah. 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 Wow. Um, 
Speaker of the House, Jill Kerensky, thank you so much for joining us and talking about all that you're working on. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Awesome. I really appreciate the opportunity. Awesome. And thank you for tuning in to Under the Dome from Town Meeting TV. You can find this program as well as our interview with Senator uh, Phil Baruth on our website, uh, ch17.tv, or on the Town Meeting TV YouTube channel. Thanks for tuning in. Have a great day.